Hey y'all, welcome to Z to Plate channel. My name is Brooke and today we're talking tomatoes. Tomatoes are my favorite thing to grow. I love to grow all different types of tomatoes. We'll talk about all the varieties, but this is my yearly comprehensive tomato growing video. Um, I have ones from years past and there's all kinds of tomato videos out there and I think really what it comes down to is listening to a lot of different things and a lot of different advice and really just trying different things and seeing what works for you. So I am in Central Texas. I am in Zone 8B. It gets very very hot and humid here um, and our tomato growing season starts a lot earlier than most people so I usually aim to plant out um, mid-March um, is when we are able to plant out that's way after our last frost tomatoes are in a good happy place I typically try and plant tomatoes when my nighttime temperatures are at least in the 50s um, I've found that in my experience tomatoes don't really love when it gets into the 40s even though it's not freezing they just really don't thrive in that environment so I wait until mid-March or until our nights are consistently in the 50s and we have no more threat of frost so all of the tomatoes that you see behind me are my determinant tomatoes so you have two different types of tomatoes you have your determinants and your indeterminants and actually I just started growing determinant tomatoes um, well I actually accidentally grew them originally I just didn't know what they were so determinant tomatoes are really really good if you like to can sauce or if you like to freeze tomatoes in mass to make sauce at a later time um, so your determinants have a genetically determined amount of fruit that they're gonna set and they have a genetically determined height um, typically anywhere from let's call it four to five feet tall these tomatoes are I bet are around two or two and a half feet tall and they still have a little bit more to go really that's your benefit of growing determinants I grow all my determinants for canning um, for canning tomato sauce salsa um, curry tomato sauce for canning and putting on the shelf for later eating and then I grow indeterminates and on the converse side indeterminate tomatoes have an indetermined height so what a lot of people do here in the south is they will actually grow their tomatoes in the spring get their spring crop and then they'll kind of baby them through the hottest parts of the year because then what they'll do is they'll actually start resetting fruit in the fall when the temperatures come down we typically don't get our first freeze until well into November maybe even December I've had years where we didn't hit freezing until January so now that we've talked about determinant versus indeterminate, let's talk about tomato planting because that's going to be the same whether you're doing a determinant or an indeterminate, at least in the way that I do things. So when I'm planting my tomatoes, I plant them very deep. We're talking probably like, honestly, 8 to 12 inches. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. So. Um, tomatoes have these little hairs on their stem called trichomes and um, some trichomes are there for pest prevention some trichomes are there and they will develop roots it's kind of a newly hotly debated topic the old thinking was that they all turned into roots so that's not the current thinking anymore but things change science changes what doesn't change is the fact that tomatoes like to be watered very infrequently but very deeply so when you plant them super deep you're really helping them retain that moisture that's deep in the ground um, and they really really like that so the other thing is I like to have really strong established root systems on all my plants but especially my tomatoes because they get really tall <laughs> These are my indeterminants and they are probably already at least three feet tall and they will continue to get taller. I've had indeterminants get up to like eight to nine feet tall before. And so really I want them to have a really strong root system so that when they get blown around in the wind and they get really tall that they can really support themselves. The other thing with planting tomatoes is you'll hear a lot of people, there's a lot of old wives tales out there and I'm not here to debunk them or tell you what to do about any of those old, old wives tales. But I am here to tell you that the only thing that I do when I plant my tomatoes is I plant them in freshly amended and mulched soil. So when I amend for the spring, I lay down um, probably about an inch of fresh compost um, and then I will lay down probably another two inches of fresh cedar mulch. Um, and I use cedar mulch because not only is that native to where I live in Texas and it's readily available and it's pretty cheap. Um, but the other thing is, is cedar, um, because of the smell, tends to be a pest deterrent. The other thing about planting tomatoes is the spacing. Now, if you follow the seed packet, you're going to be 
spending a lot of room on your tomatoes. Most tomato seed packets tell you to plant them anywhere from two to four feet apart. Um, and I've never followed that. So what I do is I actually plant my tomatoes, I plant my indeterminates about 18 inches apart. Um, and the reason that I can get away with doing that is because I actually prune my indeterminates up probably at least eight to 12 inches, uh, which we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So with my determinants, I probably get away with planting them 14 inches apart. <laughs> So here's a good example of my spacing that I do with my determinant. So I have five plants in this eight foot bed. The reason that I can get away with this is because the determinants will be completely done producing by about late June, early July. And that's really when a lot of the disease that we experience here will set in, in terms of blight and bacterial diseases. So they can actually afford to be kind of crammed together with limited airflow because they're gonna be done before the disease season really sets in. So that's why I kind of cram together my determinant tomatoes um, and I've never had any production problems. I did this last year and I ended up with about 55 pounds of sauce tomatoes out of nine plants um, that were spread in this way. So over on my Instagram, which is what work grows, you can find more like daily content. Um, it's very, it's very short, but still very fun. So over on my Instagram, I asked for tomato questions and there's two of them that kind of fit in this section of the video. So let's talk about them. The first question that I got was succession planting tomatoes. And truthfully, this is something I had never given any thought to because in our zone, you can't really plant, you can't really do a succession planting in the traditional way where you plant out your plants and then you plant more plants or seeds, call it, you know, two weeks later so that you get that succession sowing. Um, for us, that just doesn't, that just doesn't work. The way that I've heard people do succession planting here, which I've never tried, is that they will actually plant more determinants or sauce tomatoes towards the end of the summer, early fall, maybe like September-ish. Um, and then they get another round of determinate tomatoes right before the frost hits. However, if you were gonna do this in another zone, um, I could easily see you succession planting uh, determinate tomatoes a couple weeks after each other. For me, it doesn't really make sense with indeterminate tomatoes because the longer that you take care of them, um, as long as there are proper conditions, they will just keep on growing. However, I would like to take a moment to say, if you have any experience succession planting tomatoes, this is a community here. I want us all to learn from each other. Honestly, I learn things from the comments all the time. So if you have ever succession planted tomatoes, please leave a comment so that we can all learn together. The other question I got that would fit in this part of the video is about container tomatoes. Um, and I actually did a little bit of an experiment this year with what are called micro or patio tomatoes. And that's exactly what this is. These are Aztec or micro toma cherry tomatoes um, and I'm having a hard time figuring out when they're done um, they don't feel quite as firm as I would like them to so yes you can grow tomatoes in containers um, and a couple of things these are patio tomatoes so these are really formulated for that really small space grower um, and I think I made a few mistakes with them which is why my plants don't look super happy with the micro tomatoes um, but you can definitely do it you can use grow bags i think i just didn't give them quite a big enough pot i was kind of trying to test it out um, and i think what i determined was that the pot is not big enough so i think they need a little bit of a bigger pot to be successful um, but they are known for being extremely prolific now i actually did a big trial last year with indeterminate tomatoes growing them in really big grow bags we're talking like 20 gallon grow bags they were massive and um, I tried to use the Florida weave on them and they did okay I would say they didn't produce as much as they could have however I also was not on top of using fertilizer which if you're gonna grow tomatoes in containers you have to use fertilizer because they are not getting any of the benefits of soil life they're not getting any of the microbiome they're not getting any fun fungi they're not getting any of those nutrients from from the ecology of the soil. So you do have to use fertilizer in containers because they're in those contained environments. Um, so I didn't do that. I also didn't probably water them as much as I should have because when you're in a container, the, benef the benefit of putting plants in the ground versus in a pot is you get all those benefits of the soil moisture retention 
keeping your plants moist, whereas you don't get that in a pot. They're above ground, there's a lot more airflow, and so you really have to work harder to keep those plants nice and moist. So let's talk about watering tomatoes. And this is something that once I figured this out, this was probably the biggest game changer for me in terms of growing my tomatoes. Like I've already said, tomatoes like to be watered infrequently, but very deeply. And they only like to be watered at the base, especially if you live in a really humid environment. Um, I would highly recommend only watering your plants at the base because what happens if you continually water them overhead is the moisture because of the humidity is not able to evaporate and it allows for bacteria and disease to set in. So highly recommend watering at the base. When I water my tomatoes, I actually use the soaker function on my hose and I put it at the base of my plant to the count of 10 to 20. Um, and I only do that maybe twice a week. So the tomatoes really um, enjoy some neglect. I don't understand why, but it's just what works for them. So let's talk fertilizer. I prefer not to use fertilizer if I can. However, there are some times, like honestly this year, where I've had to use fertilizer because I just established this garden this year. So because I just established this garden this year, I'm still building the soil health. At my last garden, it took me probably about three years to really build that soil health to the point where I didn't need fertilizer. So the fertilizer that I've used on these plants already is called Tomato Tone from Espoma. And if you want a liquid-based fertilizer, I highly recommend the Fox Farm Grow Big. And really that's just to amp up the nitrogen in your fertilizer. So there was a question asked on Instagram about pruning. So let's talk about that. So while we're talking about fertilizer and general maintenance and watering, I want to address the topic of pruning. Um, so I prune my determinate tomatoes um, and I prune them about anywhere from 8 to 12 inches off the ground and that's to promote airflow because I plant them closer together. The other thing I prune on my tomato on my indeterminate tomatoes are suckers. Now um, suckers aren't really a good term that's more of a term to describe things that come out of the bases of trees that suck energy out of them so it's not really the right term it's just the general term that's used right so suckers are going to be these little branches that form in what i call the armpit of your tomato plant so your tomato plant's going to grow the stem and then it's going to grow the leaves and then it'll grow additional little stems that go at a 45 degree angle and i pick those off as much as i can i don't make myself crazy about it but I do it as much as I can to promote good health for the plant and to promote that airflow because these tomatoes are gonna get so tall. Now, there are some places where I forget and then I end up with two stem tomatoes or I even have one that's three. So when it comes to pruning, everybody has their own opinion on what they wanna do and what they don't wanna do. The one thing I wanna say, my steadfast rule, is do not prune your determinate tomatoes, please. So your determinate tomatoes, because they have a determined height and a determined fruit output, if you prune your determinate tomatoes, you are really just reducing how much fruit you're gonna get. Now, with the exception of if a branch is diseased or damaged or there's something wrong with it, that's a different story. But in terms of pruning it for production and airflow, you don't need to do that to determinate tomatoes. Let's talk really quick about interplanting. And interplanting is where you take specific things and you interplant them with other things. So there's a lot of conversation about companion planting and interplanting and all of these things. I have always interplanted my tomatoes with marigolds. Um, so these are just marigolds from a big box store, um, nothing special. I've grown my own marigolds before. I just moved and built a brand new garden this year, so I didn't have time. Um, there are some really interesting studies about the benefits of planting marigolds with tomatoes. Um, some of them include pest control. Um, they really, really kind of get rid of some pests that cause really bad issues, one of them being white flies. I actually lost a whole, oh my gosh, probably like a 10 by 10 foot square a couple of years ago to curly leaf virus, which is spread by white flies. 
So the roots of marigolds actually secrete a chemical that helps repel root knot nematode. Um, and this is all backed by studies. I'll leave a link down in the description box. And there's a lot of really interesting ways to interplant with tomatoes. Some people do basil, some people do all kinds of different stuff. So whatever you do, just make sure that you're looking at research, you're looking at science. There's all kinds of really interesting agriculture research out there. Um, I'm a big research-backed gardener, but you know, I also like me a good wives' tale every now and then. <laughs> The catch with marigolds that I've read about in the research is that the marigolds either have to be, um, to really reap the benefits, they have to be planted at the same time. So if you see white flies or if you see pests, you can't run out and get marigolds and then grow them. It doesn't work like that. And to get the soil benefits of the, of the marigolds, you actually need to grow them either months before or year over year. So I plant them all at the same time and I will actually continue to plant them in the same, I've got them everywhere in my garden because I think they're just highly beneficial, um, but I will continue to plant them in this garden year over year. I'll probably continue to plant my tomatoes, my heirloom tomatoes in this spot year over year. Now let's talk about doing that. So. A lot of people will say you shouldn't plant the same crop in the same soil year over year. Um, I am a big believer in amending the soil, so I operate on the no-dig method. Um, I did till to establish these gardens, but moving forward I will not till ever again. So what that means is I'm constantly replenishing the nutrients of the soil by using compost. Um, so a lot of what they talk about when they talk about not planting in the same spot over and over again is nutrient depletion or exactly what I'm talking about where there are diseases that can exist in the soil that you're planting in. Um, just to reiterate, this is all backed by research. I highly recommend everybody do their own research and make their own decisions. So within the conversation about tomato maintenance, we have to talk about trellising. So I trellis my tomatoes, honestly, a lot of different ways, just because I can. <laughs> I don't have a tried and true method, so um, the only method that I know about that I have never used is the lower and lean, and I'll leave some videos below about how to do that one. Um, but let's talk about let's talk about tomato trellising. So here we have just your traditional tomato cages that you get at the store. Now I will never use these for indeterminate tomatoes. I only use these for determinate tomatoes, and honestly. A lot of my determinant tomatoes are outgrowing these. The only reason I have these is because they were left here by the homeowner <laughs> when we moved in and I didn't have time to figure anything else out. So I have about 10 of my tomatoes using traditional tomato cages um, and they're fine for your determinant tomatoes. They're not my favorite, but they're something. So these tomato cages are ones I have sworn by for years. These are on Amazon. I'll leave a link below. I don't even know if they sell them anymore. I bought them in 2020 um, and they were not cheap. So, but they've lasted really well. I, this is now their third year and they've done amazingly. A few reasons I like these is because they have these little arms that clip like this. And so if you have a stem that's like growing instead of trying to force it up and out you can actually just open the arm and then ooh, spider you can actually just open the arm and tuck it in and it's really really easy the other reason i really like these and part of the reason i got them is because they fold down really easy and they come apart really easily and at the time i was living in an apartment and gardening at a community garden so i didn't really want to be lugging a bunch of very large tomato cages and equipment back and forth. Um, so these were a really good option for me. I've also grown indeterminate tomatoes with these cages and it's okay, but they're not quite tall enough. Um, so let's talk about one more method that is really good for doing either determinate or indeterminate tomatoes. Um, and then I'll tell you what I'm doing for my indeterminate. So this is my big bed of tomatoes. This is a 16 foot bed and it has about 10 determinate tomato plants in it. Um, and the method that I'm using is actually called the Florida weave. This is a method I've used before. Um, and it's really, really good for determinants or indeterminates. It just really depends on how much you're willing to stick by the method. What the method is, is you take twine, you have large poles at either end, and then you take twine and you put that twine and you interweave it in a figure eight pattern to kind of all bring it together and it supports itself. Um, so I do that when I have really long kind of rows of tomatoes. 
um, and it works really, really well. And then speaking of rows of indeterminate tomatoes, I have another really long row of indeterminate tomatoes in this bed. This is just heirloom tomatoes. Um, so what I have is some seven foot T posts and then I have fencing that's actually up there with it. So this whole thing is about seven feet tall and I'm telling you I will make videos probably at the end of June, early July and these tomatoes will be at the top of that fence if not taller. With these a lot of people use cattle panels, a lot of people use fencing, everybody does it differently but the benefit is all you have to do is tie the tomatoes up to the fence as they grow. Um, now I didn't put my fencing quite low enough which was a little bit of a rookie move so each of these actually has a pole that it's attached to until it gets up to the fence because that was the solution I could think of. Now if you're not a crazy tomato lady and you're not growing 500 different types of tomatoes let me show you some of the other options that I'm actually testing just honestly for viewers um, but also because I just want to see what the other options are in terms of tomato cages. So this right here hopefully you can see it okay um, this right here is a tomato ladder from Gardener Supply and I actually really love this like a lot. Um, I didn't think I was going to like it, but it's so sturdy. It keeps the plant nice and sturdy. The only thing you have to watch out for is when this main stem kind of starts growing out either side. You really want to keep this main stem growing up the center, but I love these. They don't take up a lot of space. They blend in really well and they seem to just do really, really well with these indeterminate tomato plants. This is another option and this is one that I had seen all over social media. It's called the Titan Tall Tomato Cage um, and it is very tall. It's probably, oh my gosh, this thing is probably at least eight feet tall. It's huge and so I'm still waiting to see how the tomatoes grow in it and how it supports the tomatoes. In general, aesthetically, I'm not a fan. Um, they're they're dark, they're bulky, they're just ah, I just I just don't love them. However, I could see them being hugely beneficial. So I feel like they look really dramatic in the garden, and they look really heavy um, and a little almost overbearing. But if they do a good job at supporting a really tall plant. I'm down for it so I have mixed feelings these are also kind of expensive um, and they're they were a little difficult to put together whereas some of these other ones were just really easy really straightforward unless it like does something miraculous I don't see myself being a huge fan of this one but time will tell so the last trellising method that I'm using is actually on my big arched trellis so this is a sun gold tomato and truthfully the only reason I'm trying this is because I ran out of room for all my tomatoes. So um, this is a sun gold and weirdly enough it's kind of weaving itself through the trellis um, which has been very interesting to watch. Um, so I'm excited to see how this does and this trellis is this trellis is very tall. This trellis is probably around eight feet tall as well. Um, so it's got plenty of room to grow and um, honestly TBD but you can definitely grow these on any kind of fencing and they'll do perfectly fine. So let's real quick talk about some potential issues that you could face growing your tomatoes. Um, there's a few really well-known ones and then, you know, as always, there's a few that you can't predict. So the one that's really well-known is blight. And blight is a uh, bacterial disease that happens to tomatoes when it gets too humid and they basically don't get a chance to dry out. But once your tomatoes get blight, in my experience, they're pretty toast. Um, there's not really much you can do about it other than cut off the diseased parts of the plant and finish your harvest and hope for the best. Um, so the other thing with blight is if you have a compost pile or anything like that, you don't want to introduce that disease into the soil. You don't want to introduce it into other plants. It's best just to throw those away or like burn them um, to get rid of that disease. Now the other thing that I kind of touched on earlier is curly leaf virus. So curly leaf virus is, again, once you identify it, the plant's pretty toast. Um, it's a virus that gets spread by white flies. I'll put up some pictures of what it could look like. I had this happen to me a couple of years ago and you pretty much know when it happens. The tomato looks really like mangled on the top and it stops growing and the leaves get super tiny and it, look, it looks sick for lack of a better word. Um, so at that point, you pull the plant out, 
Um, the virus is probably in the soil at that point, so that would be a situation where you would not want to plant a tomato in that soil for a while. I've read some research that says up to three years. Um, so curly leaf virus is one of those that you just really want to avoid if you can. Um, I don't spray my tomatoes with anything, I should say that. I don't spray for bugs um, unless I absolutely have to. And even then I try and use other methods like trap crops or something like that before I spray anything. So make sure you do a lot of research about curly leaf virus versus just curled leaves. Some tomatoes will display their stress by curling up their leaves. That could mean they have too much water, they don't have enough water, it could mean they need some fertilizer, it could mean it's just kind of hot that day. Tomatoes in general are very dramatic. They're very dramatic plants. <laughs> And sometimes when it's really hot out, I even have to go check my soil to make sure my soil is moist because the plant will look so sad and so droopy. And really all that's happening is the plant's just being really dramatic. And once it gets into some shade, it pops back up perfectly fine. So just remember, as long as your soil is nice and moist, as long as your soil is not dry, the plant will perk back up once it, the temperatures cool down and the sun goes down. So a couple of other things that can happen, one of them, um, and this isn't really a disease or an issue, um, I actually have it happening in my heirloom tomatoes right now, are cat-faced blossoms. So cat-faced or fused blossoms is basically when a bunch of blossoms fuse together, and then what that results in in the tomato is honestly it results in some really cool, fun looking tomatoes, but those tomatoes are going to be way more prone to disease and um, cracking and there's a lot of things that happen with that so typically if i see a fused blossom i tend to pluck it off but honestly there were a few that i kind of let go too long and then i couldn't really pluck them off so um, we're just going to rock and roll with it and see what happens it is more common for it to happen with heirloom varieties for some reason than hybrids or at least that's what i've experienced um not really sure why but it happens the other thing that can happen with blossoms is called blossom end rot. Now this will actually really impact your tomatoes and blossom end rot is a lack of calcium in your soil. So with blossom end rot, um, what'll happen is the blossom, as the tomato forms, the blossom is still attached and then the blossom falls off. Um, the blossom will actually not fall off. And what that results in is extra humidity around the bottom of the tomato, um, which then diseases the tomato from the bottom. Um, so I've had, this typically happens at the end of the season for me, whether I have my soil properly amended or not, because it just gets really humid. So I actually will go through and as I'm maintaining my tomatoes, I will actually just kind of knock the blossom off if I see it, and that tends to help a lot. Um, but if you're noticing it really, really bad, I would really seriously consider adding some kind of calcium amendment to your soil. You may see some people recommend things like crushed up Tums or crushed up um, eggshell uh, those are not going to really have an immediate impact. If you want to try and have an immediate impact with this issue, I highly recommend some kind of calcium heavy fertilizer that is liquid that will the roots will uptake and fix your problem really quickly. So another issue that you could run into are cracked tomatoes. And this will happen when tomatoes have gotten too much water. So if you notice that your tomatoes are nice and fat and they are starting to blush and you are in for a bunch of rain, Pick your tomatoes, let them ripen on the counter because you're gonna end up with a cracked tomato. Nobody wants a cracked tomato. So if you're not experiencing a bunch of rain and you're finding that your tomatoes are cracking, you are probably over loving your tomatoes with water. Back off the watering and they will do perfectly fine. So cracked tomatoes are one of those things, again, sometimes you just deal with because of the weather, um, but you can avoid it by just having good watering practices and remembering not to overlook your tomatoes. Remember, infrequent but very deep watering. Next thing that I've seen with tomatoes are your tomatoes can seem a little spotty or mottled. There are some bugs that will suck the juice out of your tomatoes. Um, one of them being uh, the leaf-footed bug. I deal with those a lot here in this area and what I've learned is that they really love sunflowers and so if I don't give them a home, they don't show up. <laughs> So I have had to be really mindful about that. I did see one in my yard the other day and I was like, no. <laughs> so uh, that is a thing that I deal with. Um, there are other bugs that do the same thing and that's pretty much a dead giveaway. Your tomato's totally fine. It's just gonna be a little bit less juicy. Um, and with those types of bugs, really the only thing you can do is pluck them off by hand. Um, they, I have tried, trust me, 
I've tried all the things and uh, they don't react to anything. Now, the other bug that you could potentially deal with with your tomatoes, which is very common, is called tomato hornworm. Tomato hornworms um, are actually a caterpillar of a moth and they get really big really fast because they eat tomato plants very quickly. So once you see the damage, um, really you need to try and find this worm because it will tear apart your plants. Um, so really you can literally just pluck them off. They're not going to hurt you. Um, and I don't really deal with them too much, knock on wood. Um, but the thing with tomato hornworms is they decimate plants fast. Like very quickly they will decimate your plants um, and so and, and they're hard to look at because they are the same color as the tomato plant so it's really important to look out for those and just just look at your plants notice the damage and then look for the hornworms and the last thing that I have experience with with tomatoes on things that could go wrong are predators getting them so I have a lot of issues with squirrels trying to eat my tomatoes granted my new backyard we specifically bought this house for a lot of reasons because we love the house but one of my requirements were no trees I don't want trees along my fence line I don't want trees in my yard unless they are my fruit trees and we have one tree and there's like one squirrel that comes into the garden however um, I have had massive issues in the past with squirrels stealing my tomatoes when it gets really hot and really dry because they're looking for water they don't even want food they don't eat tomatoes they literally take a bite suck the juice in the water out and then drop it it is the rudest thing ever. I have tried to give them water. I've tried to do all the things. It doesn't work. So I did have somebody suggest to me to use the little organza bags um, that people will put like jewelry in um, to cover the tomatoes so they can't get them. I think that's a brilliant idea. If I notice that that's happening this year, I will definitely be doing that because I did not get one heirloom tomato last year out of my garden. Granted, it was a tough gardening year anyway, but squirrels man so another question I got on Instagram that I wanted to answer was when should you harvest your tomatoes I have my first really big heirloom right here it's a dr. Weich's tomato and I've never grown them before but I've heard quite amazing things so I'm really excited so with tomatoes the best time to harvest in my opinion because I have squirrels and stuff that take my tomatoes <laughs> I like to leave them on the plant as long as I can However, I will typically pick them when they're about half blushed. The longer you leave them on the plant, in my opinion, the better they taste um, because they're really getting all of the nutrients out of the plant and they're getting the sun and there is nothing better in the world than a tomato sandwich or a BLT with a tomato that is fresh and so warm out of the garden that's fully ripe on the plant. However, with that being said, I will pick tomatoes if there's rain coming to prevent cracking. Um, I will pick them when they're just blushing and finish ripening them on the counter. Um, and I think that's totally fine and they're always going to taste better than store-bought tomatoes um, in my opinion. So in terms of picking your tomatoes, I pick them when they're about half blushed just because I don't want another animal to get them before I do um, and I don't want them to crack if we end up getting rain. There's also some really interesting conversation about what time of the day you should pick your tomatoes. Um, there's some interesting thought around only picking them in the heat of the afternoon. Um, I don't have any experience one way or the other with that because I've never been in a position to like casually choose when I go pick my tomatoes, um, especially because I used to garden in community gardens and places like that. My only choice was to pick the tomatoes when I had the time. <laughs> Um, and I think that's perfectly fine. So like I said, they're gonna taste better than store-bought tomatoes any way you slice it, pun intended. So the question that you might be asking yourself is what varieties of tomatoes do I grow? I have a full video where I go over everything I'm growing for the whole year. I'll tag that video below and it has just a section for tomatoes so you can really skip ahead because I break out that section into cherries, slicers, and sauce tomatoes because I grow so many tomatoes. So just kind of to give you an idea, I grow six different types of determinate tomatoes. Um, I grow about 25 different types of heirloom tomatoes and that includes cherries and slicers, um, which are your big fat tomatoes. 
So I grow a lot of different tomatoes. My joy comes in growing a lot of different varieties and my joy comes in using those varieties in a lot of different culinary ways. But I will call out some of my favorites. So in terms of determinants, um, I'm growing a lot of different popular types this year and I'm gonna do a whole review at the end of the season. Um, but the ones that I've grown in the past are just your traditional like Roma hybrid tomatoes. Like they're nothing special. Honestly, I got the seeds on Amazon like probably four or five years ago. They've done really well for me. I, I have specific opinions about San Marzano's, which I've talked about in the past, and they're not my favorite. So I really just like a traditional Roma type for my determinate tomatoes. However, this year I'm excited because I'm trying a few different ones. I'm trying Italian, um, uh, Italian paste, um, Amish paste, Hungarian paste. I'm trying a really cool variety called Principe Borghese um, that's supposed to be really good for making tomato paste, um, which I'm really excited about. They're smaller tomatoes and they've got really deep flavor, so I'm really, really excited about those. So in regards to slicers, my absolute favorite tend to be on the purple side. So I love Paul Robeson. I love Cherokee Purple. They're some of the best BLT tomatoes, in my opinion. And then I actually am really excited, though, because this year I leaned into a lot more yellow and orange varieties because I wanted to try some of those like sweeter, more mild and less acidic tomatoes. Um, so I've got some really fun one growings. I've got Valencia. I've got Do Dr. Weiches. I've got a Kellogg's Breakfast tomato growing. So I'm pretty pumped to try some of the more colorful varieties. And then in terms of cherry tomatoes, I love the Sunrise Bumblebee. Unfortunately, I had one plant this year and it broke in a windstorm when uh, like a week after we planted them. So I'm not gonna have any of those this year, which I'm really bummed about. But um, the yellow pear tomato is another one of my favorites. It's really sweet. Um, Sun Gold is definitely up there as well. I love Sun Gold tomatoes, but I also just don't fully understand the hype around them. I think they're a great cherry tomato, um, but some people are just like in love with Sun Gold and I just um, I don't really feel those vibes towards Sun Gold. <laughs> So those are some of my favorite varieties, but like I said, if you want a holistic list of every single variety that I'm growing, go check out that video and just skip ahead to the tomato sections to see what you're interested in. And that's my yearly tomato video, y'all. So thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for watching. If you have any of your own tomato tips that you want to leave for people, please put them in the comments. We are all here to learn together. Um, and honestly, I think it's going to be my best tomato season ever. Thanks so much for watching, happy gardening, and we'll see you next time.